you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, I don't have my phone like I normally have up here to tell me what time it is, and I only have one contact in, so I really, it's blurry, that clock back there, so some of you may have to help me with what time it is, okay? I'll know, when you go to sleep, I'll know it's time to... Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, I'm talking today, um, the title of my message is Live for the Glory of God. The Apostle Paul has been writing to the Ephesians now, uh, first, second chapter, all, most of the third chapter, uh, and he's been telling them about the work that God has done in their life and how it started before the foundation of the world when he chose them. And then as we go in through the passage of Scripture, uh, we understand that He chose us for His glory and His praise. And He regenerated us. We were born in this life. We're living in our flesh. We're walking around. We're dead spiritually. But God regenerated us and made us alive so we could understand spiritual things. And He redeemed us with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He sealed us with the promise of the Holy Spirit of God guaranteeing your eternal life. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, there is no possible way you can ever lose your salvation. And, and he, he continues to talk about the life that we have in God, the life that God has given to us. It's a new life. And he says, live it. Live it. And live it for the glory of of God and he says here in Ephesians 3 Paul's uh, taken up a prayer that he tried to start back in verse 1 of chapter 3 but he he had a little parentheses there and and now we get to where he says for this cause I bow my knees before the father now when a Jewish person bows their knees that means that the prayer is a very earnest prayer because normally they pray standing up and so what we have here is the Apostle Paul is earnestly praying, I'm getting on my knees, I'm getting on my face to pray this prayer. He says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So Paul is reminding, the, he's not talking about the, the brotherhood of man and, and the fatherhood of mankind. He's, he's referring to the believers and he's saying that believers are one big family and God is our father now some of them are in heaven they've already gone to be with the Lord they're in heaven and the rest of us are still down here on earth and he's reminding us that we're part of this big family under the name of our God it says that from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he that's God the father would grant you now he's praying He's praying. He says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man. Now I want to stop there uh, for a second. Uh, strengthened with power according to his riches in glory. Now he says according to his riches. That, you know, you'd pass right by that, but that's very significant because... Uh, it's important because there's a difference between God giving us something from his riches or it's a, there's a difference between you giving someone something from your riches as opposed to giving them something according to your riches. There's a big difference. If I'm a multimillionaire and I give you a hundred dollar check, that is giving you something from my riches. But if I'm a multimillionaire, which I'm not, by the way, um, and I gave you a $100,000 check, that would be giving you something according to my riches. Do you see the difference? It is, the one is a, just a portion, a small portion at that, but the other one is proportional. And that's what God is doing. Paul is praying that God would give us power according to the riches of his glory and since his riches are infinite guess what you got a lot of power because God has given you that 
He says, so that God, he's praying that God would, according to the riches of his glory, be strengthened with power through the spirit in the inner man. We're going to talk about that. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We're going to talk about that. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, depth to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. We're going to talk about that. And that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I'm not going to talk about that very much because it's hard for me to comprehend what that even means. Now to him, he says, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now guys, Christians have a tremendous amount of power that the world doesn't know anything about. Uh, we have inner strength that the world doesn't know anything about. We literally have power from God working in us. And this gives us spiritual th strength in our lives to empower us to have victory we can live victorious lives we can live significant lives we can live secure lives because of the power with god power we can deal with anything that the world throws at us now that's a true statement problems trouble tribulations persecution come on bring it on uh, health problems, financial problems, emotional problems, psychological problems, political problems, relationship problems. We can not only deal with them, but as a child of God, with the power of God in your life, you not only just deal with them, you can do it with integrity, you can do it with purity, and you can do it with holiness, and you can do it with courage when you have the power of God in your life. Now, we, we have a power that the unbelieving world knows nothing about. And you know what the problem is, though? Is that there are some Christians that don't know anything about it either. They don't understand the power that they have. They've been born again, which was a pretty big deal, by the way. They, God had to use the power, the same power that he used to resurrect Jesus Christ from the dead. He used that to regenerate you and me. So there's a tremendous amount of power working in us by God. And, and then he, he puts the Holy Spirit in us, which is God himself, and he indwells us, uh, which is infinite power. And even though we have so much power available to us, often Christians live hypocritical, sinful, impure, weak, unholy, worried lives. Yes, Christians I said that about. And you can be a child of God and hardly be recognizable as one. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a child of God and people can't even recognize that you are one because you're living a hypocritical, sinful, unholy, uh, weak, worried life, do you think that glorifies God? It doesn't. Of course not. But the whole purpose of my salvation, the whole reason why God saved me. Now, I know that many people think God saved you because you're the most wonderful person in the world. And you deserve all kinds of great blessings. And you're going to be, he saved you so he could make you rich and famous and comfortable. That's what many people think salvation is about. It's not. The reason why God saved us, the purpose of our salvation and the church, the purpose of the church 
is to glorify God. That's our purpose. You're not doing that, you're not living your purpose. It says here in verse 21, In him be glory, in him, to him be glory in the church, that's us, and in Christ Jesus, that's his son, which he certainly received glory from Jesus, to all generations forever and ever, amen. Now when we live in the power of God, and, and in, we live strong, holy lives, which that's what God wants us to do. God gives us power so we can live like Christ. And when we do that, we glorify God. And we do, actually what you and I do now, when we're living in the power and the strength of God, we glorify God and it lasts forever. It glorifies God now, and it will glorify God all throughout eternity. See, the things that you and I do, you think that it's just a passing moment. It's not. God's not going to forget one thing. He's not going to forget anything. He'll forgive a lot. <laughs> He'll have to, right? He'll forgive us. But he's not going to forget the good works that you and I have done to glorify his name. He won't forget even one of those. So Paul here is praying. The Apostle Paul, he's writing to the Ephesians, and he's praying to God about these people that he truly loves and cares for. And he prays that the Ephesians will be able to live for the glory of God. That's what he's praying for, that they can live, they can actually do it. That they can live for the glory of God. And he's praying that God will enable them to do it. And... Uh, he prays three things, basically, in this prayer that God would do for them that eventually, ultimately, results in being filled up with the fullness of God. Now, you're going to have to let that sink in a little bit because it's really a staggering statement for anybody to say, even the Apostle Paul, that we are being filled up with the fullness of God. That's a big order wouldn't you consider that but that's what he prays for and that's what God wants by the way you know what let me just tell you real quickly what that means it means total dominance of God in your life that's what it means total dominance and you've heard me talk about before, salvation is a death experience. Jesus died, but guess what? You are, you're supposed to also. So the fullness of God is the total dominance of God in your life. And that's what God wants, but there's steps to that. You don't just, bam, get that. There's steps to it. And this is what Paul prays for. He prays for this progression of your Christian life to go like this. The first thing that he prays for is that we will be strengthened spiritual strength in the inner man in the inner man that you would be that god would grant you he says in verse 16 according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power that's what we need we need to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man in the inner man this is the first step for living your life to glorify god Strengthened with the might and the spirit in the inner man. Now, spiritual strength does help you. Or, or, excuse me, physical strength does help you. Right? There's a big craze today about that, by the way. I mean, there's a gym on every corner. It's like church. There's church and a gym. You know, it's a... <laughs> you think about that. Isn't that true? There's a lot of gyms. And there's nothing, you know, obviously God has nothing opposed to uh, uh, gyms and uh, human strength and physical strength that's good for you. You know, if I ever get in a jam, I'm going to go to somebody who I know frequents the gym to help me. Because um, they'll be able to help me. But see, physical strength helps you when you're fighting men and doing human tasks, doing physical work here. Physical strength helps. It doesn't help you fight Satan. It does not help you at all. Physical strength doesn't help you when you're tempted to sin against God. You need inner 
spiritual strength. And some of the believers there at Ephesus, they were strong in the inner man, but some weren't. That's why Paul's writing this. They were weak in their lives. They were not living boldly for God. They were not comprehending all that God has for them. They were not comprehending their purpose in life and the strength that they have to live for the Lord and fight and stand up for God. They were called limping along in life. They couldn't handle any of their problems either. They probably couldn't handle conflicts in their homes, difficulty at work, difficulty with their children. They couldn't handle it. They're weak. They're weak. They were defeated. They just had no victory in their life. Why? They didn't have any power. Now, how do you overcome that? How do you overcome this idea of not having inner strength? Look at this next statement on your outline. The strength of the inner man is dependent upon the Holy Spirit. That's what the verse teaches. The strength in the inner man. You know what I mean by the inner man. The real you inside you. Your heart, your soul. The real you. The one that's got the gut and the grit and the gumption. The inner man. The strength of the inner man is dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's work is dependent upon your yieldedness. Write that down, your yieldedness. The Holy Spirit of God gives us the the strength to live the Word of God, but we have got to yield to the Holy Spirit. You've heard me say before, God doesn't come in your life like a bulldozer and just run right over you. He says, hey, I want you to yield to me. And he's working in us. God's spirit is working in us. But guys, there's another spirit in the world working too. And he's working just as hard. He's working hard. We're in a spiritual battle. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, we're going to go through this in a few months. Uh, He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So the devil's trying to trick you all the time. He's pretty tricky. And he's smarter than you because he's been around a lot longer. He knows all the tricks. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood and against the rulers, against the power... uh, against flesh and blood, but against the ruler. By the way, you got to remember sometimes when you're having conflict in the church with other Christian brothers and sisters, you need to try to remember they're not your enemy. They're your loving Christian brother and sister that uh, given enough time and and, and patience and love and kindness, everybody's going to come to the right conclusion if we're patient with one another, loving and forgiving. They're not the enemy. It's the devil's the enemy. The devil's the enemy. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. He's saying you're in a spiritual war. And this spiritual war really begins in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. It's your thinking, much of it. It's a spiritual war, and you need spiritual strength in order to win this war. You need spiritual strength. You need the help of God. Now, you're going to have these battles every single day. You're having them, matter of fact. You're having a spiritual battle. You're having one right now. Are you going to listen to this sermon or not? That's a battle. Am I going to check out because what he's saying I don't like to hear? That's a battle. Now, some of you are sleepy because you didn't get enough sleep last night. But uh, (laughs) some of you are in a battle saying, I don't want to listen to this. But you, get, you have spiritual battles every single day because the world, the world has different priorities than God's Word does. 
The world offers all kinds of different things and says, look, do this, do that, go this way, spend your time on that. The Word of God has something completely different, different priorities. So you're going to have spiritual battles. Now, what is a spiritual battle? On your outline, uh, it is a battle to live for God when the world says live for self, Live for fun, live for pleasure, live for greed, anything but God. And you need the Holy Spirit of God to win those battles, and nothing else is going to be strong enough to help you win those battles because the world is after you. And, and Daniel and I were doing a little mini Bible study the other day, and we were talking about how if you love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So you ought to be nervous if your life is consumed with loving the world. You need to check your salvation. Because if you love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You got battles to win, Christians. Now, in the New Testament, we're supposed to, we're supposed to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. The New Testament tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. So when the Spirit is trying to work in you and do something in you, you don't pour cold water on the Spirit of God. You don't quench the Spirit. You yield to the Spirit. In Ephesians 4.30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. So you don't do things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Sin ungodliness things that the holy spirit doesn't want you to do by the way guys the more you quench the spirit the more you grieve the spirit the less you're going to realize you're doing it because you will be desensitized to your sin only holy people really know when they're sinning only people who strive to live a pure life really understand that, oh you know i shouldn't do this but some people are so desensitized to not being dominated by God, they can do just about anything they want to do and not even feel bad about it at all. And unfortunately, it's Christians also. He says in Galatians chapter 5, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you've got to yield to the Spirit of God. You've got to walk in the Spirit of of God, and this is a simple, really a simple truth. Uh, walk in the Spirit. Uh, what that means is is walk, the word walk means your daily conduct. That's what it means, your daily conduct. So you're walking in the Spirit. Your whatever your da your daily conduct of life is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, and every day you are consciously and on purpose walking in the spirit of god you don't want to quench the spirit you don't want to grieve the spirit you don't want to get outside of the leadership of the holy spirit of god that's working within you and you're walking constantly and yielding to the holy spirit of god so the question comes up now how do i do that how do i walk in the spirit of god because that's kind of subjective colossians 3 16 tells us this is the parallel passage of this one in ephesians where Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ dwell in you richly. So your capability to walk in the spirit is in proportion, is in proportion to how much of the word of Christ lives in you. That's, that's the secret. It's the Word of God. He says to dwell in you richly. What that means is that God's Word, the Word of Christ, the Word of God, Christ is the Word, the Word of God dwells in you richly. Richly, what does that mean? Well, it's the idea that it's, it's so in you that it makes a difference in you. There's an impact. Kind of like how it would impact your life if I was to give you $5 billion today. Would things change for you? Would that impact you? Five billion dollars? I mean, you would be in comp no way, you'd be richer than Elon Musk. You could buy Twitter and Facebook. 
But see, that's, that's what it says. The richness of God's word, when Christ dwells in you richly, what it means is that his word is in you so much that it impacts you, that it changes you for the better. You're rich. Now, a lot of people know the scripture. Right? A lot of people know it. But it doesn't change them. So I'm not talking about memorizing a verse. I'm not talking about reading your Bible and just, you know, going through that, the motions of it. A lot of people know the Bible. Matter of fact, there's people that know the Bible better than I know the Bible. But you have to allow it to yield. You have to yield to it. You have to allow God's word to work in you. To change you. You have to yield to it. You have to conform to it. To the word of God. You have to let the word of God dominate your life. I've often used the phrase through my Christian life that I like to live in the world of the Bible. Not that I don't live out here in you know, real life also. But I want to know the Bible so much and have it impact my personal life so much that I'm living in the word of God. Well, guess what? God wants the word of God to live in me. And impact me. And just because you know a few verses, that doesn't mean anything. The devil knows the Bible. He misquotes it, but he knows it. David wrote this in Psalm 119. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. I mean, and there's the point, isn't it? There's the point. That's, that's what we want. Inner strength enough. I want so much inner strength in my life that I can live for the glory of God. I cannot live for the glory of God if I don't have the inner strength. I'll be f messing up all the time. I'll be limping around in this life. Defeat after defeat, sin after sin, giving in to temptation after temptation, going along with the crowd whenever the crowd says, go, if I don't have inner strength. So you hide God's word in your heart and let it dwell in you richly. Now the best indicator that tells you that you actually have inner strength is when the troubles come in your life and they hit you hard and then the challenges come up and they surround you and maybe even some evil people come into your life with the purpose to hurt you and when that happens The way you deal with that, in the midst of all of that, that's when you know that you have inner strength. Because you live for God during that time. You don't make sinful, ungodly decisions. You stay focused on Him and you love Him. And that's what Paul's praying for. He said, I don't want you to shame God. I want you to glorify God. And the only way you're going to do that is if God grants you inner strength, which you, get, you can get if you're in the Word of God. And you're letting it dwell in you richly. The second thing he prays for is that Christ would dwell in them. He's already talked about Christ's word dwelling in them. Now he's going to the next step. He's saying that Christ would dwell in you. So that, that's what he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, uh, he has to dwell in your hearts through faith because he's not literally here, right? You don't want Christ's physical body crammed in your heart. 
So Paul says, by faith. See, the apostles and the early Christians, they saw Jesus. They saw him. And he dwelled with them. He literally hung out with Jesus Christ. We, don't, we can't do that. So it's by faith that Christ may dwell with us in our hearts through faith. Now this statement is a little puzzling because Christ already does dwell or indwell Christians uh, at the time of your salvation. So Paul's talking about a different kind of dwelling here. Every Christian, God, Christ is in them through the person of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian, we got that. And he's not going to leave. So when he says that Christ would dwell in them, he's really talking about a different kind of dwelling. It's the dwelling where Christ uh, is the one, he's living in the person that is led by the Holy Spirit of God and a person who has taken sanctification seriously. This idea of separation from sin, this idea of living a pure life, this idea of living a holy life. Paul is saying, with, I want you to have inner strength through the Holy Spirit of God to where Christ can dwell in your heart. So he can dwell with you. The word dwell, it might make more sense if I give you the definition of the word dwell here. It means to settle down and feel at home. That's what it means, to settle down and feel at home. You see, Christ, and you need to get this, Christian, Christ feels more at home with some Christians than he does others. Uh, people who have strong spiritual inner life is more inviting to Jesus. It's like Jesus says, oh, I see the Holy Spirit's there too. I'll come on in. You know, it's, it's the concept of he feels more comfortable. And the truth is, for some Christians, Jesus in them, Jesus is in them as just a tolerated guest. Let that sink in. I mean, there are some people that God has saved and many times as they try to live their life, they think, man, this is, this is an inconvenience that I'm saved. Because I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want to do that, but I'm saved. Mm. Now, it's hard for the Christian that is devoted to the Lord to comprehend that happens. But it does. I've been a pastor for 37 years now, I know, or a Christian for 37 years. I've seen it happen. And this idea of dwelling is when Jesus feels at home in your life, home with you. Warren Wiersbe, in his commentary on the Ephesians, um, he gave an example of this. He said that Abraham, the life of Abraham, and you know who Abraham is in the Old Testament. He's the father of our faith. Um, he said that Abraham gives a, an example or an illustration of this close relationship that Jesus has with some people. And you remember the story back in Genesis chapter 18 when God was finally going to give Abraham a son. He had been waiting for 25 years, and he's finally going to give him a son through his wife Sarah, which he had promised 25 years earlier. But Abraham, by faith, just continued to follow the Lord and obey God and trust God and be obedient to him through it all. And finally... Jesus and two angels come to the tent of Abraham and they're going to tell, Jesus is going to tell Abraham the good news. It's, it's a pre-manifestation or pre-incarnation of the Lord Jesus in Genesis. So he goes there and while he's there, Jesus goes into Abraham's tent and he sits down and he kicks back and he relaxes. They have a big meal and eat and the Lord Jesus, the Lord, felt very comfortable being there with Abraham in his tent, eating. 
But the angel and the Lord had another task that they were going to do, which is told to us in Genesis chapter 19. They were going to go to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and check out the, to the level of sin that was going on in those cities because God is about to destroy it. And the issue, the big issue was Lot, Abraham's nephew, was in that city, in that sinful, ungodly city. The Bible says he vexed his righteous soul daily from being there. But he was in that city. And, and God wanted to go in and get Lot out. And, you know, it's Abraham's nephew. And he wanted to warn Lot and get him out before he was going to destroy the city. But, it, but you, you, it's interesting that Jesus didn't go to that city. The Lord didn't go, just the two angels. And Warren Wearsby and other writers say, well, they know why. Because Jesus didn't feel comfortable going to the city that Lot lived in, which is an ungodly, wicked city. So he didn't go. Lot's still a believer, but the Lord didn't feel, feel comfortable going to his house. And let me, I want to ask you a question. Does the Lord and Savior feel at home in you? Does he feel at home in you? Or is he having to endure many uncomfortable days and nights living in you? I mean, what are you putting... Do you, they used to say, you know, I don't smoke because I don't want to blow smoke in the Lord's face. I got a feeling that's one of the least of his concerns. You know, there's no verse in the Bible, thou shalt not smoke. But there's other verses that says for us not to do things. So, Paul is praying that Jesus would feel at home in these believers. He's saying, I want you to have inner strength so you win the spiritual battles. I want you to have the Lord. I'm praying that the Lord will dwell in you and that Jesus will feel comfortable living in you. And the third thing he prays for is comprehension of the love of Christ. What time is it? I can't see. What time is it? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Comprehension of the love of Christ. That's the third thing he's, promised, he's praying for. And Paul He's praying this because he knows that if you're strong in the inner man, if, you, if, if you're living in such a way where Jesus feels comfortable and feels at home living in you, and then he says, now you need to have comprehension of the love of Christ. And I don't think I can over-exaggerate how important it is to comprehend the love of Christ. That changes everything about you. The more you know that Christ loves you and you understand how much Christ loves you, it literally changes every single thing about your life. Everything. You name the subject, it changes it for the better. Paul writes this, he says, And that you, being rooted and grounded in what? In love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth, height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. So he's praying that they'll understand something that they really will never fully be able to understand. But even if you get just a little bit of it, it changes everything. When Jesus settles, that, so, so being strong in the inner man and having a spirit-led life where Christ lives in you, leads you to comprehend. He said, now the next step is to comprehend the love of God. So he's basically just saying that when Jesus, when Jesus is able and invited to come into your life and actually settle down in your life, when he's in really and truly invited to do that, to where you've cut out all the other mess and all the other stuff and you've realized the world has nothing to offer you and you now you've said, Jesus, I want you to come into my life 
come into my heart. I'm no longer going to ignore you. You're no longer going to be seen as an inconvenience to my life plan. And you, he's allowed to settle down in your life. And now you're saying, Jesus, I'm actually going to start giving you the attention that you've always deserved. But I was too busy to do it. And I'm going to give you that attention. So when you do that, what happens is Jesus starts revealing to you his love. And he roots it, and it's, it roots in you, and it's the ground of your life. The love of Christ. And before, before he's welcomed into your life, you ignore him. You ignore his voice. You ignore his presence. You ignore his comfort, you ignore his companionship. And we've all said the phrase that when Jesus is all you have, you realize that Jesus is all you need. But how many people really believe that? And this is what Paul's saying here. I want you to comprehend just how much he loves you. Because when you do, everything's going to change. I mean, it's going to be so drastic in your life that it's almost, it's, you cannot explain it. He says here, well, you've heard me say many times that most of your problems, your fears, your insecurities, your worries, come from not comprehending how much Jesus Christ loves you. And guys, that's a true statement. I mean, most of the, your problems are because you, as a Christian, is because you're not focusing in on how much Christ loves you. You're focusing in on all kinds of other things. Guys, there's no reason to have insecurities. Did you know that? There's no reason to have any worries. There's no reason at all. There's no reason to worry. There's no reason to have insecurities. None when you have the love of God in your life and the power of God in the inner man and when Christ's word is dwelling in you richly. It changes everything about your life. And here's the thing, guys. Satan doesn't want you to do that. And neither do some of your own friends. Because when you do that, you're going to start acting peculiar like a Christian. They won't like that at all. But the love of Christ. So Paul is praying that they will understand and that they'll be rooted and grounded in his love. This word rooted is a reference to the plant world. Which, by the way, that chocolate that I gave to the mothers, Tom told me that's really a plant. It's a vegetable. So when you eat it, no guilt. You're eating vegetables when you eat that chocolate. <laughs> I'm going to go have, home and have some. Here Paul is going into the, the plant world. Got a tree, in order for a tree to grow, it must have deep roots into the soil and so it can go down and it has to have the nourishment to give it stability, right? That's what roots are for. They give nourishment and stability. And the Christian needs that in their spiritual life. They need, they need to know, they need to have deep roots into the love of God. And again, I'm saying this to you. The reason why so many Christians live fearful, worried, weak, defeated, scared all the time, you know, uh, inferior lives, uh, bad self-esteem. Why? Because they don't have their roots deep into the love of God. One of the things, I, and I remember this plain as the as if it was yesterday when I first got saved. That's one of the concepts that I remembered. One of them is that, hey, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> I like that. That's, I guess that's my favorite, right? But the second one was that God loves me. Because the world I came out of, if you didn't have drugs and alcohol and money to, to do stuff with your friends, hey, you were, you were pushed aside. You had to have stuff to be with people. But not with God. I have nothing and he loves me. 
So it's deep rooted into the love of God. And he's saying that, I'm, I'm praying that you understand that. Now, one of the most important questions a Christian should ask is this. From what do I draw my nourishment and stability? What do I draw my nourishment and stability? Guys, if you're drawing your nourishment and stability in life from people, I feel sorry for you because they're going to let you down. The first little storm comes around, you're, you're going to fall. What do you draw your nourishment and stability from? If you're not getting it straight from God himself and from the love of God, I, I can already tell you, every single spiritual battle that you run into, you lose most of them. You're losing them left and right. And Christ feels very uncomfortable in you. And anybody who's a, a child of God that's a strong Christian can look and see, man, they're, they're weak. In the inner man. You got to have the love of God. Rooted in the love of God. Now I want to say this. And hopefully I'll be finishing here. In a few minutes. No one has ever loved you like Jesus has. No one. No one has ever loved you like Jesus has. And if I could convince you of that today. I would have. I believe I would have accomplished a great thing. Nobody has ever loved you like Jesus has. And you wonder, how much does he love you? Well, Paul, he's saying it's four-dimensional. He's saying that it's the breadth and the length and the, the height and the depth of his love. It's four-dimensional. It's, it's as far as you want to go and as high as you want to go and as low as you want to go. Whatever. He, he, his love is going to be there. As much as needed. That's what he's saying. It is four-dimensional. And, and one of the greatest things that God has done for me, and he has done this for you if you're a child of God, is that he goes down to the deepest level of depravity and sin and snatches you out of that. That's how far Jesus goes. And when you're sinning against him and actually doing things that no other person would put up with but you're doing it to God and you're sinning against God uh, and you're even trying to hide from God you know what he does if you're a child of God? he forgives you see that's the love of God he forgives you of all of your sin and guess what he's also very patient because he's waiting for you to repent and get right with him He's waiting for you to, to see the error of your ways. But, but his love is not going to destroy you or forget you or give up on you. It's going to wait as long as you need. And when you're ready, he'll lovingly lift you up. He'll put you in a, a position of honor. He'll tell the whole world, that is my son, that is my daughter. And I love them. And there is nothing that they can do, ever do to separate me from them and my love for them. See, that's the love of God. I don't know about you, but that changed my life. That changed my life. And the concept of being dominated by God doesn't scare me. That's exactly what I want. I want to be dominated by Him. I don't want any of myself and anybody who's been around me very long knows that I'm not really much help to the world Jesus is he's help now when you understand that kind of love and Christ feels at home in your life and you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and you're glorifying God which you are glorifying God if that's your case if you're strong in the inner man and, the, and Christ feels comfortable living in your life in, in, your, in you as, as, as he would in your home he's just very comfortable there and you have comprehended the love of God 
you're going to start glorifying God. Your life will be a glory to the Lord. And then you're going to be, have the fullness of God. And that's really what God wants. That's what he says here. He says that you might be filled up to all fullness of God. And again, that's a staggering statement there. That the Apostle Paul is saying that you want to be filled up. He wants these pray that we would be filled up with all the fullness of of God. God God wants to give you all that he has. And I don't really I don't I can't comprehend that. I know you can't either, but he wants to give you all he has and what we're doing is we're living our life like a bunch of tramp beggars. JP Wilbur Chapman he was a, a Presbyterian evangelist. Which, by the way, they do. There used to be Presbyterian evangelists. He tells about the time he was conducting a prayer meeting and a man got up and gave his testimony. And the man said, He said, I got off the Pennsylvania Depot as a homeless person and for a year, I begged on the streets, living like a tramp. One day, I touched a man, touched a, a man on the shoulder and said, Mister, please give me a dime. As the man turned around, I saw his face. And it was my father. And I said to him, he tells the story, he said to him, Father, do you know me? And he said, my father threw his arms around my neck. He said, son, I've been looking for you for 18 years. And you want a dime? I'm giving you all that I have. All that I have. And see, that's what God wants to do for us. And I think many times we forget this, that God's goal, and it started before the foundation of the world, His goal was to bring us to Himself. And in the person of Christ, the Bible says that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. God wants to make us like Himself. We're not going to be deity, but we are going to be in the image of our Father, God. And then God wants to fill us with himself. And again, I don't really understand what that means, but I want to. I want to be full of God. And I've learned a long time ago, Ron Smith, I have nothing for this world. But I know somebody who does. And that's who I want to be full of. Is God the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And if you're here today and you've, you say, Pastor Ron, I'm a Christian and I want that too. Well, hey, just read Ephesians, pray. Paul's praying for you and so am I. But maybe you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want to encourage you to do that. See, God brought you. You're here for a reason. And it's not by accident. And I believe that God wants you to believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. And to give Him your life. Not a part of your life. To give Him your whole life. When you do that, you'll be living for the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we just want to thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the Apostle Paul and how he prayed for Christians and and he prayed the greatest prayer that a person could pray for us is that we would have the fullness of God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church live our life strong 
in the inner man. The outside strength does do some good, but it doesn't help us with spiritual battles. And that's the fight we're in. So I pray that you would help us to be strong in the inner man, that you would grant us that. That Christ would dwell in our heart. That he would feel comfortable there. There'd never be a moment of the day where we would think, well, it's inconvenient to be a Christian right now. Lord, I pray that you would help us to comprehend your love because I do know that once we understand how much you love us, most of our problems, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, they're going to disappear. We thank you for that. There's somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, but you're working in their heart today, God. I pray that they would yield to your Holy Spirit right now and trust Christ and receive the free gift of eternal life. What a blessing to be saved freely and all your sins be forgiven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.